Okay, um, in the 1960s, uh, coarse fishing in South Wales uh, was very good, um, with some great natural venues, uh, and at that time in history, uh, we could boast a large following of anglers, possibly in the thousands or more. Um, the local ve venues uh, were my learning ground uh, for my future match fishing. Uh, and with such a variety of venues and methods, it was a great learning school. Um, Bay Reservoir, in particular, in South Morgan, uh, that's where I learned to catch rudd and tench, um, uh, especially after raking the swims. Uh, the fish seemed to come alive uh, after, you know, and, um, and after raking the swim. Um, now, this taught me a lesson sometimes uh, disturbance in a swim uh, can somehow uh, the fish can respond to you know the the noise and the splashing you know um, East Ock in the heart of Cardiff uh, that was also uh, a very good venue it was a deep venue and this is where I learned to fish the slider uh, we used to fish um, also sliders against the, the, the side of the dock um, and we'd empty a bucket of ground bait uh, I used to use dried blood uh, which I acquired from the agricultural shop, and um, I remember pouring it down the side, uh, uh, you know, of the dock and fishing uh, rod and lines in them days, of course, sliders, and uh, catching roach and uh, winning matches uh, doing it. Um, I also remember catching a chub on it one day as well. They seemed to hold me in on that dry blood. Uh, now West Dock, now West Dock was adjacent to it, it was much shallower, but that's where I learned uh, li laying on um, in shallow water can produce roach where other methods uh, didn't, you know. Um, further up up in the, the valleys uh, there was water mill um, and Peterston uh, ponds, that's in near Cardiff, uh, this is where I learned to catch tench on bread flake. Uh, Piscale Mower, <laughs> I'm on Sweden, and that's the name of a venue. Um, I was full of small tench, and uh, I learned to catch them on squat. They, do, you know, small tench love squat. Um, well, now squat is the house fly. Uh, that's the the little black things you see flying around the house. Bloody nuisance there. <laughs> anyway, um, the River Ely in some Fagans was a popular venue as well. Um, that's where I learned. Uh, to catch roach on bread. It was the only way of catching them because I could remember trotting a maggot through a huge shoal because the water was so clear I could see the fish. I was trotting through time after time and not a single bite and all of a sudden I put a bread on and I catch one. So that was a lesson I learned sometimes, you know, even, you know, you could have fish in front of your swim, uh, in your swim, not realizing it and change of bait can suddenly produce fish. Uh, now, during the 60s, uh, I was fishing local matches, um, which is, the occasional match was uh, up the valleys, but mainly it was uh, on North Park Lake and also the River Taff. Um, I also joined uh, a club called Cardiff Nomads. Um, now, that was formed in the early 60s by a few like-minded anglers uh, that, that all had one thing in common, uh, their love of match fishing. And um, travelling from match to match and area to area, uh, with no home water to speak of, hence the nomads' uh, name formulated. You know the nomads. And um, anyway, members uh, from all the local uh, angling clubs um, from South Wales, which included Morgan, Butte, Birchgrove, um, and the founder members were Larry Powell, uh, Ronnie Moore. Um, no, Ronnie Moore was uh, an ex-footballer, he played for Cardiff. Um, sadly, I think most of these have passed away now, but uh, Di Pocket, uh, there was John Griffiths, I mentioned, the butcher. Richard Candy, now Richard is still around today. A, um, unfortunately, don't fish a lot now, he's full of arthritis. But uh, Gary Evans, a local tackle shop. There's a West Midlander called Jerry Bailey as well. He'd uh, moved from the West Midlands down to South Wales and he, um, he, he joined the Nomads. Now in those early days, uh, local match fishing competitions were really concentrated on about two venues. That was Road Park Lake and, uh, and the River Taff. Uh, now it was during the mid-60s at Road Park Lake we saw our first 
international competition. Uh, the, Welsh Fe uh, the Welsh Federation of Anglers uh, had organised the first home international. Um, it was a great event, it was on our own water, uh, England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. Um, uh, it was the first, uh, as I say, of, of the home internationals and uh, I was awestruck, you know, when all the top anglers in the country came down to fish our local water. Uh, Ivan Max, uh, Kevin Ashurst, Ian Heaps, Dennis White, uh, Dickie Carr from London, uh, Ray Mumford, a, g a great friend which I became great friends with, you know, later on. Um, now, I remember uh, I befriended a, a friend, uh, still a friend now even today, a chap named Clive Roberts. Um, uh, we hi I remember we hired a boat uh, to view uh, our heroes, you know, all fishing away on their practice. And uh, as we rowed around the lake, we were actually filming. Um, and I think that's on YouTube. You can actually catch that somewhere on YouTube. Um, anyway, all these uh, anglers, you know, which were household names to, to us, like, you know, to the anglers. Um, and for prosperity, as I said, we filmed it. But <laughs> the unfortunate thing, after 15 minutes, the, the camera ran out. So we captured about 15 minutes of it. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we did get some action, including something that we knew would affect the fish in the next day. Uh, it was a flying hatch, a flying ant hatch. Uh, now, in a past experience, we found that the fish gorge themselves on this phenomenon. You know, it usually ha only happened once a year, uh, and it was happening right in front of our eyes. You know, and we thought, what a disaster! We thought the fish were, you know, topping everywhere as we were filming. It was like rain. It was like raining, and uh, anyway, all these tips were the fish were topping, eating all the um, the hatch of these flies. Uh, and uh, anyway, the next day we, we guessed it was going to be pretty hard. Anyway, on that day, I remember drawing uh, what I call the bathing stages, which is the deeper part of the lake. And um, I, 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 what did I do? I, I, I think I fished uh, the waggler. Yeah, I remember fishing the waggler. And uh, I done okay. Um, no, the Welsh team at the time, we were pretty confident that we were going to win that. But, you know, at last, the England team was so strong, uh, I think they won every section hands down. And uh, although the Welsh team uh, put up a good show for second, uh, with Ireland third and Scotland fourth, you know. So, um, as I said, England were, the, were, were hard to beat even in them days. Now, during the 60s and 70s, coarse fishing was at an all-time high. Uh, with fishing licences, you know, holders, I think there were over 4 million uh, throughout the country. Um, in all probability, due to the younger generation having uh, more free time, uh, and you know, long before computers and mass television stations appeared, uh, people did tend to spend more time outdoors. Uh, yeah, I think match fishing was at its peak then, uh, with the national angling competition tracking over a thousand anglers at a time. Um, with such interest, um, I think the, the divisions were created then, there was uh, first, second, third, fourth, four divisions um, and uh, each division, if you come in the top ten, I think, you, you'd qualify and, and go up a division. Um, now it was known in them days that more people went fishing on a weekend that attended football matches throughout the country. Uh, the Anglian newspaper at the time, uh, which ran a national league, uh, series uh, and in my South Wales area, um, the Anglian Times, it was called uh, the Anglian Times Winter League, uh, attracted 12 teams of 12. Um, and at that stage, Cardiff Nomads had three teams, um, and, and I, that's when I joined the club. <laughs> Unfortunately, I could only manage to get in the C team, and sometimes uh, I would become a runner for the A team. Now, now being involved in team matches definitely brought out the best. Um, as me as a budding match angler and um, obviously every fish counting towards your overall weight or points uh, it was important to have a runner. Uh, fishing the Anglian Times Winter League series in 1962 uh, the club managed to win through to the local stages and uh, subsequently they went through to the semi-finals on the Kentish Stower uh, which was in southern England. Uh, the prize for winning the semi-final was an all-expenses-paid trip to Northern Ireland uh, to fish the urn. Anyway, 
Um, this four-hour drive away, our team not really knowing the water, I was nominated uh, the runner. So anyway, the uh, runner uh, was an important role uh, in any team match um, because gathering information uh, was vital to you know to secure extra points sometimes in the in the, you know in the team. Of course, this was long before mobile phones and, and such thing. Um, but I can remember there was snow on the ground at the time, and uh, uh, I was running up and down the match. And I can remember a t uh, one of our team members, Richard Baton. Now, Richie, um, he actually won the match uh, using what I believe was probably the first uh, an accrued form of uh, of a method feeder. And remember, this is 1962 now. Uh, yeah, Richie, um, he uh, not only did he, 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 well, he won the match from an unfancied peg, um, and it basically uh, secured us uh, a place in the final. Now, I'll tell you all what Richie done. He, what he done, um, the method he used, he actually used an, uh, a bomb, RC bomb, what we call RC bomb, um, which is a lead weight, and what he done, he squeezed a ball of ground weight actually around the RC bomb itself. And, and used it uh, as, as a like a swim feeder and this is before swim feeders come out and basically he, he lob it out and it reached the bottom and of course it would disintegrate and using a link anyway he uh, he, ended, he, he caught him in the middle of the river because I, I was watching him and um, he amassed 35 pound of bream and he, he won it you know as I said he won it individually and uh, the team won it overall and uh, anyway it was fantastic because we, we went through uh, a place in the finals on the River Earn, Northern Ireland. Yeah, I didn't fish that uh, final event, unfortunately, because you know, I was <laughs> uh, still in, in the lower uh, team. But anyway, uh, Cardiff Nomads, um, they were a pretty good outfit in them days. And uh, I remember them, they, 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 uh, they, they actually won the final. They beat Copton Hackett, which was one of the top teams in the country uh, from Birmingham at the time. Um, so I suppose Cardiff Nomads, uh, you know, really in the Hall of Fame, uh, they were involved in winning, uh, you know, um, that prestigious match, which was a phenomenon, you know, for, for Welsh fishing. I remember the, the old guard clubs uh, I used to look up to as role models during the era that included Larry Powell, of course. Brian Gibbons, who was a, he was a tremendous angler. Um, and he, they just lived up the road from me, and often um, they would go fishing on their motorcycles and they'd drive to the matches. Um, and they used to win a fair share of money, them two. Yeah, fond memories. Now, uh, Brian, um, he was chairman of the club at the time. Uh, Ron, uh, as I said, uh, Ron was pretty good. I can remember him winning uh, a South of England Championships. Um, for the Cardiff Nomads, again single-handed, catching 33 pound of bream on the Bristol Avon one year. Um, he had, uh, let's have a look, yeah, he had 33 pound and I remember uh, asking how Ron had fished it and he said, well, he fished it around his rod tip in deep water and what he'd done, he used white ground weight, stiff white ground weight and he, he Poke his, um, he, he poked his finger right in the centre of it, and he filled it up with maggots, and he sealed it back over, and he would pluck it, you know, pop it right on his float, and uh, uh, you know, right in close. Anyway, um, fair dues. He, as I say, he went on and he won the match, thirty-three pound, and uh, that was great. Another top angler, uh, Jerry Bailey, as I said, from the Midlands, he joined the club uh, as a young angler, and uh, um, I tell you a little story, which is still. So, yeah, I'll tell you a little story about Jerry, uh, which is, you know, as I say, memories uh, from days gone by. Um, I drew next to Jerry on the River Taff, uh, an open competition. And um, anyway, after mixing some ground weight, um, it happened to be on the dry side. And uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, it was a bit windy that day. And uh, as we were fishing, uh, I, I threw um, some ground weight into the swim. And uh, anyway, because it was, it was dry, you know, a lot of it, it, it sort of flew, blew up in the air and um, went down uh, to the angle next to me, it was Jerry. And <laughs> it caught him right in the eye. And he, he shouted, obviously, with a smile. He said, 
Clive, he said, I said, I've been all over the country and I've fished many competitions, he said, and I've seen many tactics, but that's the worst I've ever come across. <laughs> well, it was, it, was, it was all in good fun, like. And um, anyway, Jerry was also a good friend of Larry and, uh, you know, great, both great anglers. Um, I don't know what ever happened to Jerry. Uh, probably passed away by now, I would think. But um, anyway, those names uh, will always stick with me as a youngster. You know, as, yeah, I'll remember them, them even today. I know to you, the viewers, they probably don't mean a lot, but uh, I'm sure some of the uh, local old anglers would probably remember. You know, um, and I suppose this is one of the reasons why I put the uh, autobiography feet together so that uh, you know memories of these uh, these uh, really good anglers will uh, will be remembered you know forever hopefully okay now tackle innovations now fishing was on a tremendous expansion um, of innovations during the early 70s and fiberglass uh, rods were superseded by carbon and boron rods um, they become lighter, they were stronger, and obviously more efficient. Uh, keep nets, um, which the innovation from knotless nets become, you know, very popular. Hooks become chemically sharper. Lead shots, now they were being replaced by non-toxic material. Um, it, apparently it was to help the swan populations because the swans uh, apparently used to digest this, the um, the split shots and uh, um, you know on the bottom of the riverbed and um, the poor old angler got the blame you know and um, anyway uh, but coincidentally uh, the, the swan population grew again after that so perhaps it did have something to do with it I don't know but uh, plastic started to replace old tackle items uh, like fishing floats, plastic floats, uh, tackle boxes instead of wood, they become plastic. Seats, you start getting, I remember the old Shakespeare plastic seats. Disgorgers, you know, uh, instead of the aluminium ones, they, they've been replaced in plastic. In fact, I think uh, anything made of wood were, not, were now being made of, of uh, plastic. Also, uh, gone with the wicker baskets as well. They were replaced by, uh, as I said, lighter uh, boxes like Shakespeare seat box. Um, fiberglass also came in, into uh, recognition as well then as uh, a good sturdy seat box. Um, another innovation uh, was uh, close face reels. Now, um, they become you know, lighter and uh, less prone to wind blowing around the bail arm. Uh, one finger press. I, I mean, in fact, I still use them even today. Uh, I know people say I'm an old bugger like, but I, st I still use them, and I, I find them unbeatable. Really, you know, they, they, they're great. Um, although they have, uh, you know, there's lots of varieties out there. I remember the, the Abu 501s and 506s. You know, they, they, you know, they're still they're still available now. If you go on eBay, you know, again the internet. <laughs> Yeah, so innovations, as I said, uh, during the 70s were, were, were the in thing. And, uh, you know, I, I wondered when, where it was all going to end, really. Um, but even today, there's innovations, uh, which obviously I'll be talking about later on in the autobiography.